thank you for the invitation to come and speak to you on that. Uh, I can see half of them saying no, not skeezers, and he's grading again. <coughs> Apologies for that. The, my main uh, uh, interest uh, 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 conflict is that I published the paper, so of course uh, I'm not unbiased. Uh, very quickly, for those of, that have never heard me talking about this subject, um, the, uh, we usually we use quantitative measures to uh, decide whether the canal is narrow or not, and we have been using the uh, dural sac cross-sectional area for years. Uh, so under 100 square millimeters, it's considered relative stenosis, and below 75, it's considered absolute stenosis. Uh, and unfortunately, there is uh, this surface measurements do not reflect the degree of entrapment of the neural tissue. And you can see here on the left that this patient has a 66 square millimeters, uh, and you can see the rootlets very clearly. On the right-hand side, you have a grade C, which means the, there is no CSF. All the rootlets are uh, aggregated together and roughly the same surface area. So uh, this, the left patient is asymptomatic, the right is symptomatic. So what can we do with the, the surfaces? That's why we came up with this grading uh, more than 10 years ago. So in essence, all the A grades are uh, non-stenotic patients. Those are just the different configurations we observed and we just put them there. But you can lump them up as one grade. So A means that uh, less than uh, the whole canal is filled with rootlets. Grade B, uh, the whole of the dural sac is filled with rootlets, but you can still identify the rootlets one by one and there is CSF around them. Grade C, uh, there is a uniform uh, gray signal. You don't see any more uh, the rootlets uh, uh, each by one, but uh, there is still epidural fat behind, and this is a severe stenosis and uh, corresponds to a myelographic block uh, on the myelographic sequences if you have them. And uh, grade D is very similar, but it is just worse because you don't even see epidural fat, and that's grade D, which is we call this as extreme stenosis. So um, we found uh, back in 2010 that there was a, a prognostic value in our uh, operated patients. We didn't have this grading when we decided to operate those patients, but we found that patients C and D uh, were more likely to fail conservative treatment. They were, the odds ratio was 30, so that's very significant, but it was patients sent to surgeons, so that is probably the reason. And patients who had grade A's and B's who we didn't operate uh, for five years were unlikely to uh, need surgery during this period of follow-up. Uh, also, it's less sensitive to orientation, so you can very easily grade without any measuring tool. Uh, we also did a survey in those days, and we found that most surgeons, actually, they did think of morphology, and they didn't take care of how uh, many millimeters a sac uh, is measuring. Now, one surprising thing is that most surgeons in Europe would operate on grade Bs, and 71% uh, of, uh, um, uh, in, in, in theory, would operate grade Bs. Uh, which is not exactly what we used to do in, in our unit. Uh, now, we know there is a poor correlation with, with images and symptoms, and Yaka, the Wakayama court uh, in, in Japan showed that very well. Uh, they found that, uh, on average, uh, in an elderly population, 30% have severe stenosis, and only 20% of those 30% are symptomatic. Now, their stenosis was measured as a proportion of the dural sac cross-sectional area. So severe stenosis was defined when it was two-thirds of the uh, uh, surface. Now, radiological criteria of stenosis vary, uh, so it's difficult. Uh, we're comparing apples and pears in those studies. So I singled out in order to understand what is it worth operating Bs, uh, As and Bs, or shall we still, still doing just the Cs and Ds? So let's look at studies that used... Uh, the, the, the morphological grading and see what they, did they find. So the Nord, Nordston study, which I call one, which is the, the one which looks at the relation between pre-op symptoms and imaging. Uh, again, that's very nice. Every, every single paper that I, will, uh, uh, that I found out, three quarters of the patients are grades C and D. So all of us tend to operate mostly on grade Cs and Ds. They found a weak association between ODI, Zurich Claudication Questionnaire and VAS and severity of stenosis, and the only thing that uh, related, to, related to the pre-op uh, ODI score was the femur grade, but then it was uh, only 3.3 points. Uh, the second part of the study showed the relation between surgical outcome and the morphological grade. Uh, so the A and B grades has less improvement, but again, the difference was small, so 4.6 ODI. And there was a ne negative association between disc generation and firmament, so the more degenerative spines you had, the less happy you were the result. Uh, now, I understand that the uh, 
clinical and radiological stenosis, um, uh, sorry, lateral stenosis were also included in this uh, series. Uh, the North Spine Registry by Clemens Weber also showed that, again, two-thirds of their patients in the registry had CND stenosis. Again, they didn't find a correlation between pre-op symptoms and post-op. Uh, ODI improvement. Nevertheless, they only had seven patients who had mild stenosis and a good result, if we're reading right the paper. So there might be a group of bias in statistics in comparing, you know, those seven good results with all the others. Uh, finally, Young et al. have published lately another paper where they, again, 71.3, exactly the same number as the previous study, which is interesting. So three quarters, constantly, all surgical series have three quarters of CND grades. Uh, and pre-op leg pain, uh, was correlated with the uh, grade and post-op result, but the correlation coefficients was uh, rather uh, correlation was weak with small uh, co coefficients, as you can see. Uh, now, this is a, a nice study. I participated as a blinded review, so I, I, uh, I didn't take part neither in the surgery nor in deciding who needs surgery. So, Anne Manion published that uh, in 2017. Lateral and foramenal stenosis was excluded from the imaging. 82% uh, were decompressed. Also, uh, they throw in 15 patients with no stenosis, so, uh, since I was blinded, just to confuse me. Uh, the, uh, the outcome was measured pre-op and at 12 months post-op. And what is significant, uh, there is a subgroup of patients who had true, the biggest subgroup, which had also true claudication, which was commented on the notes. Uh, and what is important is that if you can see here, the, the grade D patients had in this subgroup 20 times more chances to reach significant uh, improvement clinically, which is 2.2 on the uh, COMI scale. Now, conversely, if you look at the A's, if you operate on an A, you have a 40% chance of getting better. Should we really operate on those patients? And B, it's like tossing a coin. 50% of the B's get better with surgery. So I'm con I, I, I like this because this is what I've been doing, but I'm trying to convince other colleagues to do the same thing. Now, do post-op results depend on the degree of stenosis? Well, prior to the publication of our paper, uh, several studies did nevertheless show that outcome, yes, de depends to, uh, to the degree of stenosis measured in very, di very different ways. Now, why is there a poor correlation between pre-op symptoms in surgical patients? We don't know the relation between the severity of stenosis and symptoms, but we could imagine that you, know, you cannot go get worse than worse if you have a lot of pain. So we're looking at patients who are on the on the right upper side of the graph, so we're like an asymptote. So if you examine differences between those patients, probably you won't find a lot. Uh, also, ODI, unfortunately, is less disease-specific, but we all use it. Uh, and also, some patients with grade A and B stenosis might have pseudo-radicular symptoms in the legs, which are not related to uh, nerve entrapment. Now, why is there no relation uh, between MRI uh, and results? Well. Many studies include also foramenal stenosis, lateral stenosis, hernia discs, facet discs. This is actually the Zurich study. We looked at all those patients and we found in our court all those cases which we had to eliminate for data analysis. Uh, there is a, usually in all those studies, there is a very small number of A and B patients. Uh, the inter agreement obs observing of the grading is not great. So you could uh, sometimes get it wrong. You grade it B and it's C and vice versa. Do we do a facet derivation? Is that why grade A's and B's get better? Uh, does back pain improve after decompression? Is that why patients are happy with grade A and B's? Uh, does surgery have a placebo effect? Yes, I'm sure it does, but uh, I don't know if you agree with that. Nevertheless, if we see this graph, if you want to have good results, uh, stick on grade C's and D's, and you should be okay. Uh, now, uh, should we prophylactically decompress now a level uh, above uh, fusion? Um, that's what I've been doing, but I'm not sure it's the right thing. If someone has a grade A3 or B next to a fusion, I would decompress prophylactically, but maybe it's too aggressive. Uh, it's been shown that if you have a developmental stenosis, you have more times more chance to have surgery at a level above if you have just a simple decompression. So it does progress, the disease progress. Prophylactic uh, decompression, uh, if done properly, does not uh, destabilize the adjacent level. And revision surgery drops from 10 to 3% uh, in a study uh, uh, from Italy, that uh, where they routinely decompressed 3-4. But maybe it's too aggressive. Uh, this is a case I inherited. This patient had two level A lifts, uh, and at the time of surgery, she had a grade C uh, stenosis above. The surgeon didn't uh, decompress her. I only got her four years later. So it's okay, four years later, you know, why, why decompress her prophylactically? Uh, this grading does not address uh, isolated recess stenosis and foramenal stenosis. 
Uh, for amyl acidosis, uh, I'm not going to go into the details, but gives you sciatica, single root claudication. I find several patients have, uh, for amyl acidosis, they only complain of buttock pain. That's quite interesting finding. Uh, now, Kunogi in 1991 did a very nice uh, grading of for amyl acidosis, which was revisited in inverted brackets by Lee. Uh, now, just a quick word. Lee, uh, a radiologist from Korea, seems to be liked, like to redevelop gradings using the same infograms. Uh, so he, they published the same year as us, some months later, their grading, which is very similar to ours. And then the Kunogi one. So I just let you draw your own conclusions on revisited uh, gradings with different names. Now, why do some patients develop for amyl stenosis? Uh, we know they have spondylolisthesis, scoliosis, asymmetrical disc degeneration, DDD with disc height. But we found that there is an anatomical predisposition. That's why people, probably some patients, will develop stenosis. We found that if your pedicle height uh, is more than 50% of the vertebral height, you have ti five times more risk of developing foraminal stenosis. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that's what I only can do with for severe foraminal stenosis, scoliosis, a lifts or uh, fusion surgery to relieve patients from leg pain. But there is now a trend for younger surgeons to do endoscopy and a meta-analysis of uh, 14 studies shows that uh, uh, you know, they, it does work and they have a very low uh, neurological uh, complications with just transient uh, dysesthesia. Uh, but that's, you know, uh, maybe that's the future. So in conclusion, there is some evidence to support uh, that uh, there is a relation between MRI uh, grading and post-op outcome. Um, decompression of CND grades yields uh, better results uh, than A's and B's. Shall we delay grade B decompression? And as we did see from uh, uh, the previous uh, Zurich paper, the more pain you have, the more uh, you will benefit from surgery. So maybe we should let those be mature and wait and operate on them when they get C and more symptoms. Uh, and of course, yes, uh, one should avoid decompressing grade A's, uh, unless, of course, you, know, you can have a grade A and very severe pain if you have a lateral stenosis or a foramen stenosis. And shall we prophylactic decompress uh, other levels? Uh, we don't know yet. So those are the young surgeons here. Please uh, copy this slide and those are future research ideas. Uh, grade, do a population study with grades and see you know, how often do you see a C and a D grade in asymptomatic patients. Uh, what happens to the grade change with time adjacent to fusion? Uh, it would be interesting to review all the A and B operated cases from the Nordstern, the Zurich and the North Spine studies, lump them together and see why those patients get better. Uh, and then back pain outcome follow decompression related to pre-op grade. Those are, you know, some of the research ideas that which might be helpful in the future. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Konstantin. This was a great overview. Please come to us. We want to discuss the topic. So are there questions from the audience? Please. Hi, this is Mr. Hermansen from, from the Nordstern study group. Thank you very much for your kind words. I just wanted to, to draw attention to the, the uh, e-poster. Uh, we have published uh, 220 patients with adjacent level stenosis, and we found no difference in, in clinical outcome at, after two years. So the, the decompression of adjacent segment yeah, so prophylactic, uh, was was no... prophylactic decompression of, a, of the adjacent yeah. level did not, sh did not show any improvement in our cohort. So it's worth waiting. So, so I, it's, it's published in the, in the e-poster here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, over there. Yes, thank you for uh, your uh, paper for discussion. Uh, I want to ask, uh, you consider uh, the, your classification based on the MRI in the supine or in the standing position? No, of course, in the supine. We only had, uh, we had one uh, stand-up MRI, uh, which went bust because it was costing twice as much in Switzerland. So, uh, uh, you're right, there are some differences and there are some, uh, but they are mild. You don't change two grades by uh, standing up. Because but you could have more lateral stenosis and more uh, recess stenosis by, in standing. Because considering all spinal stenosis, usually it is a, uh, uh, manifest more in the uh, upright position. Of course, you're right. Yes, the MRI is a static. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Firstly, thank you for the wonderful uh, talk and uh, the amazing work that you do uh, for spine, uh, you know, uh, spine surgery and the improvement of spinal knowledge. 
But are you slightly contradicting where on one hand you say we shouldn't operate A, B and only operate in C and D, but prophylactically you're operating on A and B? Yes, because I'm, I'm, I'm scared of failure of surgery. You know, I'm an anxious surgeon and I feel, oh my God, he's going to come back again in pain and he's telling me my surgery didn't help. Uh, so, but you're right. I think I have to not to treat my uh, visual anxiety on the patient's MRI. And uh, uh, you're right, absolutely right. Yes, you shouldn't be decompressing asymptomatic uh, uh, patients Thank prophylactically. Yeah. That also goes into the direction what uh, Pierre Svitmark says here. How do you explain the uh, 40% of patients uh, becoming better with grade A? Uh, but yeah, looking at the, your last uh, slide, where you had your, uh, your proposals for future uh, scientific work, that was exactly one of the uh, questions you put forward. Look into why, why, why they improve. Would well, you have a preliminary answer for that? Yes, now? If, if Alf Nahamson uh, watches from upstairs, he'll say that it was placebo effect. Putting a white coat, doing big surgery on someone, you have a 60% placebo rate. <laughs> if, if you believe in surgery. That's why patients who want surgery, they get better. Mm -hmm. uh, so how, how do you handle patients uh, with uh, moderate or maybe also severe uh, foramen stenosis having multiple level central stenosis. So we see these patients. They're elderly, several levels involved, but also foraminal. Um, so do you address this foraminal stenosis in the first instance, or talk to the patient, or look at the clinical presentation if they have more radicular pain uh, rather than claudication? So I think these patients are hard to handle. And it's, it's, a, it's a gut feeling, uh, but I'm 62, so I'm getting some experience. And, and So m my impression is that uh, patients with foraminal stenosis, which is symptomatic, they present differently. They have something more acute. They have a sciatica or buttock pain. It's constant. Uh, it's usually more severe uh, than the typical claudication. So uh, usually if I see foraminal stenosis, I ignore it. Uh, and uh, I have to, had, I had to, I've been caught two or three times uh, where you know, I had to go back in and do a fusion for foraminal stenosis. But I would only, if they have good claudication symptoms, Sitting disappears. Foraminal stenosis sitting doesn't always disappear. Some patients get worse on sitting. Lateral bending. Some patients with foraminal stenosis have more pain. So I, I use my gut feeling and clinical judgment, and I'm, afor, I'm, afor, I'm afraid it's not evidence-based. It's uh, uh, experience-based. So I don't decompress uh, foraminal stenosis radiologically if I'm not convinced that it's, if it's just proper claudication, I, I wouldn't touch it. But would you decompress this rather than doing a fusion? Decompress the foramen? Uh, I'm not very good at that. Uh, usually the foraminal stenosis I see, it's very severe. It's asymmetrical disc degeneration, scoliosis, uh, a forward slip, uh, so spondylolisthesis with asymmetrical disc uh, degeneration. So that, those are the good cases. I'm, I'm trying to start now endoscopy. I'll, uh, I'll take you in five years. Yes. <laughs> we have five more minutes and we have two more uh, people at the microphone. Please, uh, first the gentleman up here and second the gentleman over there. Uh, do you think that there's a multiplier effect if, given all the data uh, given all the data that you have in terms of cross-sectional area, um, if you look at the effects of, of the uh, sagittal or the facet tropism and the effect of disc height, is there a multiplier effect of those factors on the grey area for your Bs and maybe early Cs? No, I haven't looked into that, I'm afraid, no. But it's all data. We could go back in and, uh, and look at those, of course, yeah. Thanks for the tip. Yeah, um, I'm not sure whether I'm deviating from the, from the uh, main subject, but for grades A and B, uh, do you have a hint or suggestion of subject, subjecting those patients for, for example, uh, diagnostic block or injections and uh, quantify their improvement? And the second question, for those grades, if you have functional X-ray, not MRI, and it showed some element of instability. Do you tend to uh, change your plan? Thank uh, you. All my patients have a standing X-ray, which is probably as good as a functional. Uh, if you have a big slip, you will see it, and you write, yes. Uh, I, do, I do have some patients who have a great A's, and they have a, a standing X-ray with a big slip. I would, f I would uh, fix those patients, uh, but they don't have usually the same symptoms as the classical claudication, not always. 
Sorry, what was the first question? Uh, do you subject them to uh, diagnostic blocks or injections? Uh, all patients before a, surgery, B. yes. A and B. A, B. Every patient before deciding whether he needs surgery will have an epidural injection just, for, uh, just to make sure that we've exhausted conservative treatment. A's and B's, they wouldn't, it wouldn't be diagnostic. I send them to the pain clinic. Okay, thank you. And they do, what, you know, they do usually uh, facets. But I don't believe in injecting facets diagnostically and then deciding whether someone needs fusion. I hate fusion for back pain. <laughs> Constantine, we have a question here uh, from Basel Abu Seri. And he asks us to look especially in that group of patients uh, who have no improvement post-surgery. And um, what, what he says is, um, how do you uh, investigate uh, these uh, patients? Uh, do you always do, a, for example, a post-operative MRI yeah. in order to assess the reason why? Yes, I do the post-operative MRI with a lot of uh, anxiety to see if I did the right level, even though I do pre-operative, uh, uh, intraoperative x-rays, oh. uh, and also to see the quality of the decompression. Yep. Uh, and yes, uh, I've had one or two patients where, uh, well, maybe more than one or two patients, uh, where I thought I haven't been very good enough in decompressing. And those are patients with cons cons uh, small, narrow canals uh, from the start. You can see if your canal is narrow from the start. If you go to the L3 level, go to the pedicle level, and if you see, th if you see that your canal is more than half filled with nerve roots at L3, those patients are, have a very narrow canal, and some of them might need a full laminectomy. So those patients with very, very small canals, I've been caught with those. Mm -hmm. In terms of clinical presentation, so we know that after decompression, also back pain gets better. So claudication improves, maybe radicular pain, the recess stenosis, and then also back pain. Do you see like, the, the type of back pain? You see a difference uh, compared to like, this arthritic uh, arthrosis type of back pain? Because it always says, yeah, a clinical investigation, and then you see that. But I think it's, I find it very difficult. Uh, I, I can quote uh, Bob Malholland, who is an, uh, uh, an old surgeon who used to give us very wise tips. And, and I practice this still. And I think he's right. We cannot prove it. If you have a very severe stenosis and your patient tells you, I only have back pain, but if I sit down, my back pain disappears, 50% of those patients get better. Uh, that's another topic worth looking for. And I think patients who have back pain that completely disappears and they, they stoop forward and the pain completely disappears, but also they have very severe stenosis. There I, I tell them, look, you have 30 to 50% chance that you will start having claudication. I have one in five, one in two chance to get your back pain better. Might be worthwhile decompressing your spine. So, uh, and I've been surprised to see patients where back pain disappears. And some patients forget the claudication, tell me, doctor, I have no back pain now. Yeah. And they say, I didn't operate you for back pain. So I think it's worthwhile looking into the details and find who we can op improve from those patients. Yes.